Well, uh, welcome everyone. I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. First of all, I appreciate everyone coming to the session. Hopefully, you're going to learn a lot. Uh, we're talking about getting started with Orchestrator and Service Manager. Uh, my name is Eamon O'Reilly. I'm with the Program Management Team within System Center, focusing on Orchestrator. And uh, with me today is Alex Verkinderen, who's a System Center MVP, focusing on Data Center and uh, Data Center Management. OK, so what are we going to cover today? Um, we're going to look at how System Center and Microsoft start thinking about enabling private clouds, enabling self-service, and, what, and what role orchestrator and service manager play in actually completing that full picture of management all the way from the bare metal up to the end user. We're also going to have a couple of demos to really kind of show you how the seamless integration between service manager and orchestrator that enables you to deliver on that promise of on-demand, self-service, all those things you associate with a cloud by actually integrating all of the human processes you might have and you can model inside a service manager with the system automation that you can do inside of Orchestrator. And so when you combine those two things together of the human processes and the system processes, you actually get the opportunity to start to think about enabling self-service throughout all of your organization whether that be in the um, lower levels inside of the infrastructure, all the way up to your end user who wants to actually consume the resources and services that you, as an IT person inside the data center, would want to offer. So I think there's really two things I'm hoping everyone takes away from today's session. And that is, you know, you really need to start thinking about self-service and looking for opportunities throughout your entire organization to enable self-service. And the second thing is, once you figure out what those self-service opportunities are, you'll want to start to think about automating those end-to-end -end capabilities. So when someone goes and they request something inside your organization, you automatically have the policies and the processes and the governance applied through automation so they can get those services and those resources from your organization in an automatic way. OK, so here's kind of how. Microsoft and System Center think about clouds and how do we manage the cloud OS from System Center. And so there's really three main parts. There's the kind of application owner, the consumer of the resources that you provide and the services inside of the data center. And on the far side, there's those people who actually create the infrastructure and the clouds that want to be consumed by those end users. And so you think about it from the left-hand side, you may have a user coming in and say, I need to get four VMs for testing purposes. I need to build an application on that. But I don't need it monitored or backed up because it's only going to be in um, test. But when I move it over into production, then I want some policies applied like ensure monitoring is enabled, ensure backup is there, make sure the certain network it's on for security reasons. And so the policies may change as that end user moves throughout the life cycle of their application and what they're trying to do. And so when you think about how do we actually enable those end users to kind of describe their policies and their requirements without having to do something custom all the way through. And the way to think about that is as they request those services, you want to be able to model those different policies and those capabilities of the cloud through service manager and through automation so you can actually deliver what they need by them just selecting what kind of uh, requirements they have and then all of the business logic and the rules required to um, deliver on that service can be done through Service Manager and through Orchestrator by managing the clouds and the infrastructure behind you. And it really doesn't matter what kind of cloud you have. You know, you could go to a private cloud, it could be a hosted cloud, it could be a public cloud. But once you actually have those clouds defined and those capabilities of those clouds, that's really where Service Manager and Orchestrator can now come on top of them and actually figure out what is that business logic, what is the governance policy that we're going to apply to that so that our end users still get that self-service capability, but they get it on demand by still ensuring all of the requirements that we as IT people need to make sure get adhered to and that they actually are requiring. But instead of them actually having to do a bunch of requests and have all the manual processes, we really need to start thinking about delivering this as one solution that actually, once they come in, they just get it as they would as if they went to Azure, Amazon, any hosted, or a private cloud.
So that's middle area is what really we're talking about today. And so that's going to be the focus for the rest of the talk. We're not going to talk about the infrastructure piece as much. We'll mention a little bit of the self-service capabilities. But our main talk is around how to deliver that service delivery and automation that brings all of the infrastructure together with the end user. And there's really three ways you have to think about delivering that um, end clouds to the end user. And the first of those is you have to start thinking about standardizing the capabilities. You know, I think we live in a world we have for the last few years where, you know, every application is a little unique and there's all requirements on every single thing we do. And so that required IT basically, you know, building custom infrastructure and custom applications just to support the end users. And the problem with that is once you start doing everything custom, it's almost impossible to start delivering self-service. And if you look at all the clouds that are out there today, you have to start thinking about what are the standards that we're going to offer to the end user. And the reason we actually do that is because once you can actually standardize them, then you can actually think about offering those in a self-service way so that when they require them, the automation behind the scenes can actually use that standardization and deliver it directly to the end user. So always think about standardizing. And a lot of things, we have the infrastructure in the cloud. So as you build up using Hyper-V and VMM and you describe these clouds, you can describe the capabilities of the different clouds. And then you take those capabilities and you package those up as an offering inside of Service Manager. So as an end user requires new capacity, VMs, a certain type of security requirement, networking, those different types of requirements can actually be standardized through the cloud, through Service Manager. And then when they request them, we can actually implement that full solution through automation with Orchestrator. So a lot of the talk today is going to be about how to actually bring all of those assets you have in your environment into Service Manager, create these service requests for your end user, and then as they actually provision and ask for those things to get done, how automation with Service Manager can deliver those without requiring any intervention. But if you actually do require the intervention, Service Manager has the capability as well for change management, anything else where you actually do have to require manual intervention. It's built into the product as well. So kind of with that context of, you know, we have the consumers and the self-service um, capabilities like app controller and system center or part of service manager, and we have the infrastructure being provided, all these clouds by VMM, maybe they're hosted, they're local, they could be in Azure. So we have the two ends. Now we're going to talk more about, okay, let's talk about those middle parts. And the first thing we're going to do is talk about service manager and its capabilities. Then we'll uh, talk about orchestrator and then talk a lot about how those things work together to deliver on that promise. So Alex, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, walk through some of the service manager. Thank you, Eamon. Before I start, I would like to ask a few questions. Uh, who is using service manager at the moment? OK, quite a lot of people. Who is using orchestrator at the moment? Cool, interesting. Awesome. awesome. Um, so like Eamon uh, told us uh, before, service manager 2012, uh, will give you the capability to provide IT as a service to your end users. So basically, you will empower your end users uh, with the self-service capabilities. To provide the self-service capabilities, you need to build a, a self-service catalog. A self-service catalog will contain a bunch of uh, service uh, requests, and a service request, in fact, is a collection, a bundle of uh, request offerings. So to give you an example, uh, you can have a service offering um, for the human resource uh, department. And inside that service offering, you can have different request offerings. Let's say um, onboard a new employee, um, create a new mailbox, and so on. So a service offering is a collection of uh, request uh, offerings. Now, those request offerings, and we will go uh, into more details about that uh, later on, but those request offerings, you can automate them. You can um, orchestrate them with um, Orchestrator. So we have an uh, integration. We have a connection between Service Manager and Orchestrator. And we can, when you develop runbooks inside Orchestrator, you can reuse them inside Service Manager to automate the service uh, request. And we will give you an example uh, later on today in, in, the, in the demos. Now, another important component inside uh, Service Manager is the CMDB. When I ask my customers uh, if they have a CMDB, most of them will say, yes, we have a CMDB. 
But when I ask them, is your SIMDB up to date? Well, not a, lot of, not a lot of customers will say, yes, my SIMDB is up to date. It's uh, difficult for them to have a SIMDB that is up to date because the IT environment is uh, changing all the time. Uh, we have new laptops, uh, new servers, uh, new users, uh, employees leaving the company and so on. So it's uh, difficult for them to have a SIMDB that is always up to date. Now with Service Manager, we have natively uh, connectors with uh, Active Directory, with Configuration Manager, with uh, Operations Manager and so on. So with those connectors, we can basically keep the CMDB updated at all times. Uh, when a new user will join the company and a new user will then be uh, created inside Active Directory, that new user will automatically be uh, inserted or imported inside the CMDB. Uh, all the properties of that uh, user, like email address, uh, phone number, uh, the ma manager of that uh, user, will also be put inside the SIMDB. Uh, and those attributes can then be reused later on inside the service offerings. Uh, to give you another example, if that new employee is uh, requesting, let's say, Office 2013, um, he can go to the portal, uh, he can request Office 2013 with the service uh, offering, and because Service Manager knows the manager of that employee, we can automatically send an email to, that, uh, to the manager for approval. The manager can then accept or deny the request, and then uh, Service Manager can then automatically connect to Configuration Manager to basically deploy Office 2013 uh, for that new employee. Uh, we also have a connector with the operations uh, manager. Well, basically, we have two connectors with the operations manager. The first one is the uh, configuration item uh, connector. Uh, so all the objects that are being discovered and being monitored with operations manager, we can insert them as well in the CMDB. Um, so first of all, we have servers and computers from Active Directory being inserted into the CMDB as well. But then we can see which applications and which objects are running on that server and add those extra objects, add those extra attributes on the, on the server, thanks to the operations manager server uh, connector. So we will know the IP address, uh, we will know the memory, we will know, know the disk size, and so on. And all those attributes, all those components can be added to the, uh, the server or the computer configuration item inside the CMDB. Uh, we also have a connector with the configuration uh, manager. Um, so the configuration manager connector will also insert extra attributes uh, to the, uh, the computer uh, configuration items, like, uh, for example, missing uh, updates. If you have um, Windows updates being managed by a configuration manager, you will see on the configuration item uh, form uh, of that computer, you will see which updates are missing um, thanks to the configuration manager uh, connector. We also have a connector with the VMM, Virtual Machine Manager, to pull down all the let's say the fabric components uh, managed by VMM, which um, uh, virtual uh, machines, uh, we manage the virtual hard drives, the templates, and so on. So all those different components from the different products, Active Directory, Configuration Manager, Operations Manager, VMM, and Orchestrator as well, we can pull them down inside the CMDB. That will give you huge uh, added uh, value. If um, one day you have an incident or one day you have an, an issue uh, with, one, uh, with one server, I can tell you the service desk guys, they will be very, very happy if they have one console, one form um, showing all the different attributes of the configuration item that is having issues. Um, thanks to the IP address information, thanks to the, the logical disk information and so on, the service desk guys, the first line uh, service desk guys, they, they can troubleshoot much uh, faster. So, so your time to resolution will shorten um, a lot thanks to uh, the up-to-date uh, CMDB. Um, now that CMDB is uh, used then as well for the incident management, the problem management, change and release management. And because we have all those connectors integrated into the CMDB, let's say you want to make a change to one server you can also know very easily and very fast and very quickly what kind of impact that change will, uh, will have on your business service as a whole because we have all those connectors 
Uh, we know that server is part of this um, business service. So if you have, let's say, a SharePoint business uh, service with uh, 20 SharePoint uh, servers, and you want to do a change on one uh, server, you will know that because you make a change to one uh, server of that business service uh, being SharePoint, you will know then that you have an impact on the SharePoint uh, service. And you can then send an email, uh, automated or not automated, uh, to the end users saying that uh, the business service SharePoint uh, will, uh, will maybe have some uh, performance issues or maybe some availability issues because we're doing some uh, change, uh, change management. Um, so, yeah, we have a tight integration with the other system center uh, products, um, but we also have data warehouse and, uh, and reporting across the system center suite. Uh, to give you an, an example, I like to give um, real life examples. Uh, so, to give you another example about uh, business um, intelligence and reporting, um, if you have a connection with, uh, with VMM, and you're deploying uh, clouds, you can basically uh, install a charge back uh, reporting uh, functionality on, on top of, uh, of Service Manager, and you can start creating uh, cubes and start creating business um, intelligence on top of those uh, clouds that you offer to your end users. That is useful uh, if you want to use internal charge back and uh, charge the different uh, departments um, for the consuming the, the different uh, clouds. We have a question? Um, actually, do you mind waiting until the end? We'll take some questions right at the end. Um, perfect, thank you. So, to be able to give the end users uh, the self-service capability, uh, first of all, the, the service administrator or the, the service manager outer, he needs to create an, a template, a service request template. And a service request template will define the business uh, processes. So if you want to create an, if you want to offer a service to your end users, you need to create a, an, a template. And that service template will uh, define the, the process. It will define all the activities um, that needs to be done for the, the service to be uh, fulfilled. So inside a service offering, um, you have different uh, steps, different activities. You can add a manual activity, you can have a review activity. If the manager needs to uh, review the service request, you need to add a review activity. Uh, if you want some automation and some orchestration inside the service offering, you need to add a runbook uh, activity inside that service offering. So all of those different activities um, you define them in the service request template. Uh, so the, the service request template basically um, will drive the automation uh, thanks to the runbook uh, integration. Uh, once we have a service request template, we make a request offering. And with the request offering that is based on a, temp a service request template, you define the inputs, the, the user inputs. Uh, so what kind of uh, fields the user needs to, to input. Uh, if, you, if he wants to create a new virtual machine, let's say, uh, he needs to specify the virtual machine name, the virtual machine size, what kind of, uh, how much memory he wants to use, the CPU, uh, disk size, and so on. So all the, the user inputs, uh, you define them in the request uh, offering. Uh, and that the request offerings, um, you create them in the service manager console. I will show you later on in the demo how to, to do that. But um, you can create nice looking uh, request offerings without being a, a dev guy. Personally, I'm not a dev guy. I'm not a developer at all. Uh, I see some people smiling in, in the room, but I'm not a dev guy. And, I, and I'm certainly not a SharePoint uh, dev guy. But thanks to a service manager the service request templates, the request offerings, uh, I can create nice looking uh, forms and publish them on, on SharePoint without any coding. Without being a dev guy, I can create forms and publish them on SharePoint. Um, I will show you later on as well how to, how to do that. Uh, so once you have created the request offerings, uh, you create an, uh, a service offering, and like we said before, a service offering it's just a collection of uh, request, uh, request offerings. Uh, you then publish the service offering on, onto SharePoint. So again, without being a SharePoint 
dev expert, you can publish uh, that very easily onto, uh, onto uh, SharePoint. Now, you can, of course, um, define security delegation and role-based access on the service offerings. Uh, if you have a service offering only for the human resource, you can scope down the, the console, or you can scope down the portal so that only the human resource department can see uh, those uh, um, request offerings, the human resource uh, request offerings. Uh, all of those uh, request offerings and service requests and so on, they are stored as well in the, in the CMDB. Uh, and we, we, in fact, we reuse everything that is stored in the CMDB. So we reuse the runbooks, uh, we reuse the, the fabric components in, that are stored in the CMDB, we reuse the, the users, computers, objects, and so on. So everything that is stored in the CMDB, we can reuse them uh, in, inside the service, uh, service offerings. Um, and thanks to the, the workflow automations, we can uh, create, let's say, uh, automatically an email and send that to, uh, to a manager for, for approval if, uh, if needed. So once we have defined those uh, service uh, offerings, you publish them on, on a portal, on the service manager portal. That uh, portal is based on the uh, Civilite uh, web parts um, published into SharePoint uh, 20, 2010. And you can customize that uh, Look, the look and feel, in fact, of, the, of those web parts. You have an example on the, on the screen now of the, of the portal. Um, and the service catalog, like I said before, you can uh, scope it down uh, you, using uh, security uh, delegation or role-based uh, access if, uh, if needed. So let's have a look now at... Um, switch, uh, the portal. <coughs> It's, uh, I think it's three, no? That's one. Uh, two, two, two. There. Okay. Okay, so this is the service manager uh, portal. Uh, you can see the different uh, request uh, offerings uh, we have. So we have a request offering uh, called uh, building uh, access. Um, inside that um, request offering, inside the service offering called building access, we have different uh, request offerings um, to request building access um, and so on. Uh, we also have one um, service offering called public cloud infrastructure uh, services. That's the one that we're going to use now for, for the demo. Uh, so inside that uh, service offering public cloud, we have a bunch of uh, request offerings like uh, create a Linux machine inside uh, Azure, uh, deploy an application to Azure, uh, but also upload a VHD uh, to Azure. And that's the one that we're going to use now for the, uh, the, the demo. Uh, so as an IT administrator, I can um, upload a VHD that I have on-premise inside my, my environment, inside my, my uh, let's say, uh, infrastructure and I can reuse that VHD uh, into, uh, into Azure. Uh, I just need to upload the VHD uh, to Azure using the Service Manager uh, portal. Uh, then um, Orchestrator will kick in and do some, uh, some magic that uh, Eamon will, uh, will show you uh, later on. Um, and then we can reuse that uh, VHD on Azure to basically create an, a new virtual machine. So first of all, we can customize and create our own uh, customized VHD. We upload that VHD to Azure, and then we can reuse that uh, VHD to create a new virtual machine. So that's what we're going to show you uh, today. So we click on the request offering called Upload VHD. Then we need to select which uh, VHD we want to, uh, to upload. So you can see all the VHDs uh, we have now in, uh, inside the CMDB, in fact. So you can see here that we're reusing the information that is stored inside the CMDB. So we have all those uh, VHDs uh, inside the CMDB because we have a connector with uh, VMM. Uh, 
Uh, so VMM is pulling down all the VHDs and storing them inside uh, the CMDB. Um, I will now use this uh, VHD. So that's a sysprepped um, machine. Just click next, click on uh, submit, and it will now, in fact, upload uh, that uh, VHD uh, to Azure. Uh, so first of all, I can review my, uh, my requests. So upload VHD uh, to Azure. You can automatically uh, see that a runbook activity has been added to my service uh, request. So the runbook activity is called upload VHD uh, to Azure. If you now go to my um, my service manager server, you will see the the requests being uh, created. So you can see uploads VHD to Azure. It's now in, uh, in progress. Uh, when we click on it, you will see you will see inside the activities, you will see my runbook, uh, runbook activity being, uh, being launched. Uh, so that's a service, uh, that's a request offering, sorry, um, that has been uh, created automatically uh, with, uh, by clicking or by creating a new request offering on, on a portal. Uh, we automatically added that uh, runbook um, activity uh, to it, but you can add as many activities as you want. So that those activities are automatically added because we created a service uh, request template, and uh, inside the service request template, we added uh, only that uh, runbook activity. But you can have you can have as much activities as uh, as you want. You can also uh, add approval. Uh, activities if you want. So this one uh, contains two activities. First of all, a review activity. So the manager needs to approve uh, first and only then we go to the next, uh, next step. Uh, all those fields like uh, priority, uh, source and so on, uh, those are um, automatically added uh, because we define that as well in the, in the templates. So the, the guys, the service desk uh, people, they don't need to uh, select anything here. It's automatically uh, pre-populated for you using the, the templates. So if we then go to uh, the runbook automation activities, uh, you will see all the runbook uh, activities. The upload VHD uh, to Azure is uh, still in, uh, in progress. So basically it's now uploading uh, my VHD uh, to Azure and it's about 10, 16 uh, gigs in, uh, in total, so it will take uh, quite some, uh, some time uh, to upload the VHD uh, to Azure. Um, but let's have a look at the, the console of, of Service Manager in the meantime. Uh, so in the work items pane, uh, besides the uh, activities, uh, you also have the incidents, uh, the problems, and, and so on, uh, the release uh, management um, with, within the library, uh, workspace, uh, you can see all the, the runbooks that we have uh, synced with, uh, with Orchestrator. And you can see uh, my request offerings I have uh, published. And I will show you the request offering that we just uh, used. So the upload VHD to Azure, that's the one that we just, uh, just used. So you, you can customize the description, add an image, and so on, and publish that autom automatically to, uh, to SharePoint. And inside the request offering, that's where you, you need to define the user inputs. Uh, so you, now for this request offering, we just had the VHD uh, name, which is, uh, which is based on a, on a query uh, result list. And that query result list is uh, using uh, objects that we have uh, saved or that we have uh, stored inside uh, the CMDB. Uh, but you can add as many. Um, user inputs or user prompts as, uh, as you want and reuse those uh, user inputs inside the uh, runbooks that uh, Eamon will show you uh, later, uh, later on. So you can uh, configure those uh, user inputs and, and so on. And then you only need to publish that, uh, that request offering to, uh, to uh, SharePoint. Now, 
the first time I created my request offering, I forgot to push or to select uh, published to a SharePoint. If you don't do that, you will not see your request offering inside, uh, inside SharePoint. I took, the first time it took me quite some time to, uh, to find this because I didn't want to read the, the guys who didn't want to read the documentation on TechNet, of course. Uh, so it took me quite some time to uh, figure that out, but uh, don't forget to hit uh, publish. <coughs> Um, inside the templates, we have our service uh, request uh, templates. Another best practice is uh, to come up with a naming uh, convention. So, so I use uh, SR uh, templates and then create VM in Azure or SR template upload VM in, in Azure. Um, if you do that, uh, it will be much easier later on to, uh, to find uh, your service request uh, templates. Uh, so remember, a service uh, request uh, template, that's where you define um, your business uh, process, in fact. So inside a service request template, you define all the activities um, for that service uh, request. Now, we only have one called the, uh, the runbook activity to upload the VHD, but you can add as many uh, as you want. You can add um, approvals and, and so on, uh, manual activities as, uh, as well. If, uh, if you need some manual intervention, you can add that as well inside uh, your service uh, request uh, template. Once you have created that uh, service request uh, template, uh, we create a request offering based on that uh, service uh, request uh, template, and we then publish it to, uh, to SharePoint. So you see, without being a dev guy, without being a SharePoint dev guy as well, I customized my uh, forms and I published them on, uh, on SharePoint and you can do that in, in, uh, in five to 10 minutes. The most important thing is to define the business uh, processes. You need to know, uh, if you want to offer a service request to your end users, you need to know what is your business process, which activities, which different steps uh, uh, I need to do uh, for my service uh, request. And that's, that will take the longest uh, time. Creating, creating the templates, uh, creating the request offerings, it's not uh, that uh, difficult. It's uh, coming up with the business uh, process and defining those different uh, steps. Uh, that will take uh, most of, of the time. And you need to, you need to do that uh, very, very carefully and very, very well. Um, inside the configuration item then, um, that's in fact the, the CMDB. Uh, so you will see all the, all the computers, all the, the images from, uh, from Azure as well. Uh, all the computers, all the users, all the um, logical disks, and so on, all of that is uh, synced with uh, Active Directory, with Configuration Manager, with Operations Manager, and, uh, and so on. So I'm just going to open one uh, configuration item, and then I will uh, hand it over to, uh, to Eamon. So you can see the DNS name, NetBIOS name, Active Directory information, and so on. Um, all of that is coming from the different connectors we have with, um, with Active Directory uh, configuration manager and so on. Uh, the hardware information, uh, software and, and so on. Um, so you will have an always up-to-date uh, CMDB uh, thanks, to the, thanks to the connectors. Awesome, Alex. Um, I think the big takeaway when you start looking at what Service Manager provides, it has a lot of capabilities. And I think when I was talking to a few of you, most of you have some system center pieces already deployed. And so to really take advantage of the work you've already done in Ops Manager or you're using VMM, you can start to bring all of those into the CMDB and then start to leverage these offerings and these services based on all the work you already are doing and then give that to the end users so they can actually um, use those services as they need them. But let me go back here. I think you remember um, Alex kicked off an upload uh, VHD from VMM into Azure. So if you haven't seen um, Orchestrator before, here is the designer. So with the designer, we basically have a set of folders and structure runbooks that we can create to basically do almost any kind of automation that you would want to do inside of your data center. And so that can be something very simple up to something more complex. 
Well, all of those capabilities can be defined inside of Runbooks in the designer and then hooked up to Service Manager or even hooked up to some other event that may be happening. So we have the ability to not just be triggered by Service Manager, but we can reach into other systems, monitor for events, and when those events happen, we can kick off Runbooks. So it's basically a pull as well as a push capability inside of Orchestrator. But let me talk a little bit about the actual runbook that we created to upload the VHD. So the first thing you'll notice here is when you open up this, uh, actually, I'll go to upload. So here we get the SRID. And so that initialized data activity are basically input parameters to the runbook. And so this is going to come from that service request when it actually gets submitted. And I think the best practice here to think about with Orchestrate and Service Manager is you could pass a lot of parameters and add a bunch more um, input parameters here and take them from the user. But the best thing to do is just take the service request ID and store all of the user information on the service request itself. Because then you have all that information stored centrally inside the CMDB and you can go back and use it. And one other uh, benefit of that is we basically create a contract between Service Manager and Orchestrator for these runbooks. And so if you start modifying the parameters and adding them, you're going to have to resync and reset up the connection again. So if you only have the one service request ID, you can basically change the runbook any way you want, but that contract between the service request and the runbook won't get broken. So definitely look at doing this for almost all of the integration you do between Service Manager and uh, Orchestrator. So what is it doing? So basically, what we're doing here is we're just going to get the parent service request. The one thing with the orchestrator, if you uh, haven't used it before, is we have this idea of the data bus. And so anytime you see a uh, white space here, it allows you to basically click on it and subscribe to the, what we call our data bus. And the benefit of this data bus is as you perform a set of activities throughout your runbook, Everybody who does some work for you, they actually put the results and important information back on the data bus. And then activities further down can just pull stuff off that data bus, do the set of work they need to do, and then put it back on the data bus again. And so one of the things to think about as you build out runbooks is, you know, try not to put any hard-coded information into runbooks. Really keep them as simple as you can and always pull information from some other place like Service Manager or use some variables inside of Orchestrator or store them somewhere else. You want to really avoid trying to put any hard-coded data in your runbooks. So here I could go back and I could actually go back to the initialized data and get the service request ID and then go look that up. So I look up, I get the service request. Then I get the SR details. I get the related Azure VM. So basically that will go and find out the VM. Then I get the VHD that's on that related service request. And I call another runbook called Upload VMM VHD to Azure. So again, a very simple just drag and drop capability where you just go over on the left right hand side for all the different integration packs and activities we have inside of Orchestrator, and you just drag and drop and configure those for the business process that you have. And so this business process is basically pretty straightforward is give me the VHD and then I'm going to go and try to upload that to Azure. So here you can see I'm calling that runbook and it's going to move it up to Azure. And so you can see it's actually running. So you can see it's running away. And it'll take quite a while. The one thing you'll notice here is we have a lot, there's hundreds of activities that Orchestrator ships out of the box to allow you to do, uh, connect into a bunch of systems and orchestrate your work. But if you need to write some PowerShell, you also can just open up, write some PowerShell directly inside of here to execute additional tasks that you might have inside your data center with your own custom business logic. And so you could write PowerShell inside of here. I'd recommend if you've only got 15, 20 lines, then just type it in. If you've got, you know, maybe 50, hundreds, then think about maybe storing those in PowerShell files and just referencing the PowerShell files inside of here. The one thing to notice here, though, is this published data I was talking about. So what this PowerShell is doing is actually integrating with um, 
our other component apps uh, controller inside of System Center. And it actually is going to use that component to upload the VHD to Azure. So just with a few uh, <clears throat> lines of script, I can actually go and call. You can see it here. Import module app controller. And then basically just say add using a command lift from app controller that image from VMM up into Azure. So you've customized, you've run infrastructure, you've done all these VHDs so you can actually use them. And now you want to make those available as an offering in some ways to your end users so they don't have to just use the pre-canned images that are in Azure. They now have the custom ones that might have specific configuration that you need inside of those images are now available to them just by actually hooking together service manager, orchestrator, and then have orchestrator talk to all the different pieces um, of your data center. So even this one is still uh, running because we're still uploading yeah, so this one is still running, and uh, that one could take, you know, a half hour to maybe 45 minutes uh, to complete. But the nice thing about orchestrator and automation in general is you don't really care how long it takes because you could just go and you maybe have five or ten VHDs you want to do. You just kick them all off. <clears throat> It'll go run, do all the work. You don't have to wait watching it. And then when it's finished, you could actually go send an email back to you saying they've all been uploaded. You can add retry logic in here. You can basically implement all of that logic you would have to do manually inside of a runbook and have it complete without any intervention from the end user. Okay, so let me go back to um, my deck a little bit and talk a little bit about how Orchestrator works. You saw a lot about Service Manager and it has a lot of capabilities, but let me talk a little bit about how Orchestrator uh, works together. But I think, Alex, you can give a summary. Um, of kind of what that demo was doing, and just uh, highlight a little bit of that kind of integration we have between Orchestrator yep. and Service okay. Manager. Um, so in fact, we can automate those uh, request offerings thanks to uh, Orchestrator, because we have that uh, connector with, uh, with Orchestrator. And in fact, uh, Service Manager is going to call the Orchestrator web service that you see on, on the slide now. So Service Manager will call the uh, Orchestrator web uh, service, uh, thanks to that, uh, thanks to that connector. Uh, after that, um, a runbook activity uh, will be uh, will be launched, and we defined that runbook activity inside the service uh, request tem template. So everything, all the the user inputs that uh, <coughs> that user filled in on the portal, we are now going to use it with the runbook uh, activity. Um, so all of that is being pulled down or inserted inside or defined inside the request uh, request offering and that uh, that request template sorry that request template will then be published to the service uh, catalog uh, that we just saw a couple of uh, minutes uh, <coughs> minutes ago and like we mentioned before you can add as many uh, runbook activities or as many manual activities or as many uh, approval activities as well inside your uh, request uh, template so it's very important to define again, that business uh, process inside the, the template. It's important to define the different steps, the different activities inside that, uh, that template. And then you need to publish it to the service, uh, service catalog. The end user is then going to uh, request uh, a, new, a new offering uh, by, connecting, uh, yeah, by connecting to the, to the portal, uh, creating a new uh, service uh, request. The service request is then going to uh, launch or to uh, connect to the, uh, the web service of uh, Orchestrator um, and uh, launch that, uh, that runbook, uh, like we just did with the upload uh, VHD. So I connected to the, the portal. I created a new uh, request by um, uh, connecting to the portal, um, selecting the VHD I wanted to, to upload. A sales manager was then uh, connecting to the Orchestrator web service, launching that uh, runbook that uh, Eamon just uh, showed us. Um, the one that was going to upload the VHD to, uh, to Azure. Um, and then we can uh, monitor that, uh, the, the runbook as well. So service manager will know, will know when, this, when the runbook is, is done. So when the runbook is finished, we will see that as well in, uh, in service uh, manager. So that's very important as well to know that the end user, he can launch or he can request an offering and he will know the status about his own request um, as well. He will know if the request is still uh, running, if it, the request is uh, pending, 
if the request is in progress or if, if the request is uh, finished. So at all times, the end user will know the actual status of his uh, request offerings thanks to the tight integration and thanks to the, the web service that we uh, can, uh, can call. Great, Alex. OK, so I think you get a feel there for kind of all of the capabilities. Service manager is a very powerful component. Orchestrator is a very powerful component. And so you know, the session is kind of getting started. How do you actually think about bringing in all these capabilities service manager offers, all the capabilities orchestrator offers, and actually start to deliver some immediate business value to your organization based on these two uh, pretty large components that are part of System Center? And so when I look at Orchestrator and I see, okay, what can it do really well? And I always come down to these three things around integration, orchestration, and then automation. And so if you think about it in the same way, every time you try to complete a process inside your organization, you basically have to figure out first is, what systems am I talking to? What integration do I have to do to enable this process to actually complete? And so you always want to say, do I have the ability to connect into all these different systems? And one of the powerful things about Orchestrator is it's got a lot of what we call integration packs that allow you to connect to all those systems in your environment. So all the system center ones, but then a lot more as well, like FTP, um, Active Directory, and then a bunch of third party ones as well. Some IBM ones, the VMware, and then we have partners delivering additional integration packs. And so it really allows you, no matter what you have inside of your organization, you will have the ability to connect up into all these different systems. And if there's one there that you are just custom and there's no integration pack available for, we actually have a toolkit that allows you to actually build your own integration packs and really complete that end-to-end -end process as you uh, try to embrace automation into your organization. But that's kind of good. The first thing is you have to be able to talk to all these machines. So what's that integration look like? But then you have to orchestrate. So what is the process? I think Alex mentioned there the hardest part of service manager is almost defining the business rules. And it's the same with orchestrator. You know, I talk with a lot of you. I talk with a lot of customers. And the challenges really are you know, every department does things a little differently. The security guys might have a process. The storage guys might. The virtualization guys. And so it's hard to figure out what this process is. And so there's two ways to look at that. One is you can get all these guys together, which a lot of customers do, and actually describe the process, and then orchestrate and implement that process inside of Orchestrator. And that actually works really well, and that's kind of what Orchestrator has been used for for quite a while. But also the opportunity, I think, when you start to engage across all these different silos, is to start thinking about that standardization I talked about earlier. Because that's really where you start, if you're going to see the kind of big jump in benefits, you need to start standardizing on what these processes are so that there's not as many that you can actually deliver to the end user. So that's good. You've had the integration. You've figured out what your processes are. The automation part actually is going to be the easy thing. Orchestrator is a very easy uh, tool to use, and you'll be able to actually describe most of your processes very, very quickly and see immediate value based on that. So who are these orchestrator users? We basically have, as kind of a standard model we have inside a system center, is we basically focus on four different people. So the main um, user of Orchestrator is going to be people like yourselves who are just the IT professionals. So this is really targeted to people who are somewhat familiar with scripting, are able to bring things together. And so we've built this very specific designer to really focus on enabling you as an IT professional to describe your process inside that designer. And as you can see, it's a very drag and drop, configured through the data bus. It allows you to quickly describe your processes. We have operators. So if you start to get a lot of success with Orchestrator, you'll start to notice you end up with a lot of runbooks. You could end up with 50, 100, 1,000. And so you, we have an operator view. So we have a web-based console that allows you as an operator to figure out what's going on inside your environment and take action as you need. Of course, I mentioned our toolkit, so we have an SDK like a lot of system center components. And this really is a simple SDK that allows you to actually build your own integration packs to talk to other systems that we may not have out of the box or that our partners are not providing. And then the last is, you know, we're going to invest a bunch in automation. How do we actually show the value of all this work? And so because we have a web service that's built on OData, very easily inside of Excel with Power Pivot, you can just point to our web service pull in all the data, 
and draw up any reports to kind of show the ROI of all the investment you're making in automation. Because a lot of what will happen is it look like things are just getting easier, not actually harder. And so in some ways, the more invest you do, it's just from the end viewers, they're, they're just like, this was easy. I just requested something and things just happened. So you want to be able to show that there's actually a lot of work involved in enabling that self-service capability and showing that back to the business user is something really uh, important an orchestrator can offer. I won't spend too much time, but I'd like to kind of just show the architecture to give you a view of how Orchestrator looks when you actually deploy it in your environment. So we have basically a management server similar to other system center components. And this really is where you'll actually import all of your runbooks and store everything that gets goes into the database. We have that web console capability. So we have a web service with a console there that you, as an operator, can go and manage all of your runbooks. And then we have these critical runbook servers that basically do all the work. So all those runbooks you're authoring in the designers, you can actually get those, distribute those out to different runbook servers in your environment, and then have them just continue doing work. So you kind of just let them go, and then you can monitor. We have a management pack where you can monitor the state of those runbook servers and the whole entire environment. But again, it's a kind of a standard architecture that you can make uh, highly available across all of the runtime components. Um, to make sure it's up to the same par as the rest of System Center. So I was talking with a couple of customers before, and I think when you come to a session like this, a lot of times you're thinking about, okay, how do I get some fast wins? What can I do with Orchestrator to actually get going? And a lot of times you can do a lot very quickly. So you may want to do this full end-to-end integration we're talking about with service manager and orchestrator, but you may just want to do a few small things like manual tasks. But when I see this kind of list, and most of these things probably apply to a lot of things you do today, but I always kind of remember back when I first started uh, Microsoft, and we used to start building a lot of software, and then to release it, we had a lot of manual testing we had to do. It was just the way things went, and so when you made a change late in the cycle, we basically had to rush and get all the tests going and really get it working again. And so it was really hard as you got near the end of the release cycle because you'd be constantly just running all these tests and every time some developer made a change, you'd have to do a bunch of manual testing. And so what they decided to do quite a few years ago was, you know, they took a step back and said, we're not gonna be able to deliver the software the same way if we keep doing things the way we have in the past. And so in a lot of ways, they had to take a step back in order to take two, four, six steps forward. And it really changed the mindset around how we actually build the software and build the automation, basically the test automation with the software as we build it. So it doesn't matter if you make changes, we can automatically run all that automation and validate it. And that was a big investment we made in tools and processes and a lot to actually get where we are today. And I think in some ways it's very similar when we look at IT. You know, everybody's kind of under a lot of pressure to actually just keep things going and do things faster, do things better. Let's just keep working really hard and take more tools in and do what we have. And so I think the challenge really we all have is to sometimes we have to take a step back, figure out how we make it better, and then we can take two steps forward and another two and another two. And so that's really, I think, what service manager and orchestrator is about when you think about offering things as self-service and then actually automating and orchestrating that work for you. But again, you're going to want to do this by trying to align with what System Center and Microsoft is doing with clouds. Because that, in some ways, that's the beginning. That's standardization on the clouds and all the way up to your end users. So hopefully you start thinking about that as you start to work with Orchestrator and Service Manager. You can get some fast wins, but hopefully you'll take a step back as well. So I usually have this slide to give you a view into what are the things you may want to automate across. So again, there's lots of different systems in your environment. We know we have a heterogeneous environment. It's not going to be all Microsoft. You're going to have different storage providers. You may have Linux running in your environment. You'll have different management servers, different management providers. And so we know the process to actually complete an end-to-end task usually means talking to lots of those different uh, management and technology vendors. And so Orchestrator is going to give you that ability to to integrate and talk to all of those. And so once you describe your process, I would ask, you know, don't describe your process just in the area you own. Try to think across the end-to-end 
and come up and use Orchestrator to actually complete not just a single process, but the end-to-end -end process. Okay, so we're gonna show the second demo now, which is basically, I'm gonna flip over to my laptop, because um, we know from our past experience that uploading that VHG is gonna take it quite a while. But I just wanted to try to complete this scenario and actually going back, and after that VHD is up, how would the end user now, that development team, that test team, that app owner, go and leverage the work that was done behind the scenes to get the VHD up into Azure? And so I'll flip over, and I think Alex will just um, look at the self-service portal I built that kind of completes that scenario. So we already uh, uploaded the VHD uh, to Azure. So now we're going indeed to create the new, uh, a new virtual machine inside Azure using that uh, VHD that we just uh, uploaded. So it creates a new virtual machine inside, inside Azure. You go to the form. You then select the Azure image that you would like to, uh, to reuse or the Azure VHD that you would like to, uh, to use. Uh, you, can have a, you can see as well uh, all the other uh, existing uh, Azure ima images that you get out of the box using, uh, using Azure. Uh, but now we would like to use our own customized uh, image um, that, uh, yeah, that we customized and uploaded to, uh, to Azure. So it's called uh, Demo uh, VM. You then need to specify a computer name. I will call it MMS 2013. I think the takeaway is all these fields you're seeing are basically all defined in that request offering Alex showed you before. So if you needed more information inside of here, like the network or whatever you required, you could go and collect that information and enforce the business rules around that. So this is where you can describe the policy and offer it out to your end users. So we'll just select an extra small uh, VM size, click next, and then uh, submit. But as you can see, you can customize this, uh, those forms um, easily, indeed, within the, the templates in, uh, in Service uh, Manager, and add as much um, fields or as much user inputs as you would, you would like. Then again, we will, have, we will see the newly created service request and the runbook activity. Uh, create Azure VM uh, activity, and uh, even will know will now show us which uh, what that um, activity is uh, is doing exactly. Yeah, so I kind of it's basically this create VM one will then get called, and it's basically going to do a very similar thing. So you know you look for design patterns when you start building these run books. You know if I do something well, can I reuse that over and over again? And so when you look at this one, it almost looks the same as the upload VMM. VHD one, in that they basically start doing the same uh, thing over and over again. So here's this one, you get the parent, you get the details, you get the information associated with it, and you call another run book to do the work. And if you look at the create Azure one, it's almost the same thing. Get the service request, get the information off the service request that I need, and then call a run book to do the work. <clears throat> and so you'll start to develop these design patterns and best practices around run books that you'll reuse over and over again. And then we basically just go into Azure, and we'll actually go and create a VM based on that. And again, the nice thing about this one, there's integration packs here for Azure. So if you wanted to do stuff like manage their certificates, so that's a problem where you've got 50 certificates up there and you don't want to expose them to your end user because they may expire, they may be management certificates that you don't want them to have access to. You could control all of that um, logic around certificate management and not really expose it to them. Even though it's there and something has to be done, you as an IT organization can offer that value and the security around that to them without them having to worry about it. And it's a similar way after I upload the VM here, based on that image, I could hook up monitoring. So maybe now you wanna have OM start monitoring that so that you can actually tell if it's healthy. Maybe you wanna do some backup of that. How would you hook that up? All of these different capabilities you can describe and then expose to that end user as just drop downs and fields that they would want to do. And this is really where we're trying to get to is all of IT is really understood and it's starting to deliver IT as a service that we've talked about for the last few years. 
But whereas the private cloud, some of these hosted cloud and public clouds are kind of pushing us even faster than we may have gone before because that's what they're offering. And we need to start looking at offering a very similar model from our own IT organizations. And with a lot of the system center tools, you'll be able to do that. Let me see if I have a... So this other is the app controller. So one other component we have from that service capability we said we talk about, we have service manager where you can request a lot of offerings and enforce the business logic. But then we have app controller that gives you access to all of those VMs that might be in Azure or they may be up um, in VMM or in a hosted location. You can actually view and manage all of those for you. And so this is what your developer would use to actually go and start using those services that you provided to them. But this can happen automatically without them having to do any work. They'll just go, and depending on what the policy is, so it might be that for test VMs, I'm going to send those to my hoster. But if those are highly valued um, services that have dependency with on-prem, then maybe I'll bring those to my private cloud. And maybe a hoster has different type of capabilities they offer. And so based on these policy and requirements of the application, you can kind of decide what's the best thing to do with those applications and still make it very seamless to the end user because you've enforced that business logic inside of service manager and orchestrator and tying those two things together. Okay, so here's what you would see and the VMs would start coming in. I created the MMS 22 MMS demo and they'll just come in as that uh, VM gets created. Okay, I'm gonna stop because we only um, just have over 10 minutes and there's a couple more slides I wanna talk to and then give people a chance to answer some questions or ask some questions. I know some people stood up earlier. Okay, so what does it all mean? We have service managers uh, that could do all that CMDB, request offering, incident management, and then we have orchestrator that can do all the automation behind the scenes. And so when you look at this combined across the organization, what we've done with these two components as part of System Center is we've brought in all of that information that already exists and you're probably managing inside of your data center, brought it into Service Manager, and now because we have that, we can actually start to say, okay, how do I deliver self-service capabilities across all these different things? So you might be client and you might be your configuration manager, and that's your main focus, and how can Orchestrator help deliver all those capabilities? All of that can now be built in through Service Manager, exposed as service request offerings, and then implemented through Orchestrator and automation. So one thing I talked about along the way was integration packs, because that really is the crux to almost everything you'll do inside of your data center, is that you have to be able to talk to all these different systems. And that's really what Orchestrator was built for. It was built basically to talk to other systems, and we have a lot of integration packs that we ship out of the box to enable you to connect up all these systems and start automating them. So you can see we have all of the Microsoft, or a lot of the Microsoft integration packs available. And then we have a lot of third-party ones available as well. So if you are running VMware, or you've got some IBM NetCool, or you've got some other HP work, you can actually go talk to those systems and still deliver self-service through Service Manager, allowing Orchestrator to do the work of integrating across all those different um, systems. The one thing you'll notice, too, if you're just learning about Orchestrator and starting to use it, is there's actually quite an active community of people who are building their own integration packs. So basically customers like yourselves who are just building integration packs to complete some of their end-to-end -end scenarios. As well, we have partners who are building additional integration packs into more common, larger suite of applications. So what do we do with SP1? So I think the big... Uh, changes we made was we wanted to fully support Windows and SQL. So those are huge releases, as you know, that came out with SP1 that we wanted to support as part of System Center, and that's what we did. But we also built a bunch of integration packs, so we built that new Azure integration pack you just saw that we released with SP1. We built the FTP. We had that um, on the kind of backlog for a while. We finally got around. We built that FTP integration. It seems like FTP is used quite a lot, which I wasn't really sure of, but then the more and more I talk with customers, there's always some scenario where FTP comes in handy. And then we did the exchange ones. 
So we did an exchange user and exchange admin so that you could actually go and manage all of the exchange capabilities through a central orchestrator automation tool. And then Service Manager came out with a cloud services process pack. And so this is basically a pack that integrates service manager requests and offerings with automation through Orchestrator, combines those together, and you can download, install, and you get out-of-the-box capabilities to actually go and do that VM provisioning. Uh, a little bit like we talked about against Azure, will work against VMM and Hyper-V. And then Chargeback also came out as a new capability that's inside of Service Manager. OK, so this is basically the last slide I have. And I kind of wanted to bring it up because I want to reinforce the message of where is Microsoft, where is System Center going, and where is Service Manager and Orchestrator. And so I think there's going to be continuous investments in this cloud in the back end, bringing in additional clouds, trying to standardize what those are. And we know the industry is going towards self-service. And people just want stuff on demand. They don't want to have to wait. They just want to know, why can't I get that thing now? And so really where you see service manager and orchestrator coming together is how do we apply all the business logic, all of the human approval, the change management you still may need to do, as well as the automation of all of the back-end systems so that to that end user, they just get it as they need it. They don't even know what cloud perhaps it's on. They just want some resources. They want some VMs. They need to deploy their application. And all of the change requirements around that policy you need to enforce can be done through service manager and orchestrator. So I think this is going to be that growth area that enables you as a customer to start thinking about, I want to embrace cloud, but how do I offer that out? What does cloud really mean? I think through service manager, through orchestrator, you can actually start to see some of those benefits very quickly. You don't have to do that much work to actually get going, get some value, and then build over time until you actually accomplish IT as a service um, that we've been looking for. OK, so with that, I'm going to. Uh, Stop. There's a bunch of references uh, we put in here. You can go up and learn more about Service Manager or Orchestrator. There's a lot more sessions during the week I'd encourage you to go to. There's some Orchestrator sessions, Service Manager session, the hands-on lab. I'd appreciate it if you could go there and then let us know how those labs are. Let us know how the sessions go. And particularly, let us know how this session went and give us some feedback, because we'd love to fill out the evals and actually help us make these sessions better and better over time. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank uh, Alex for setting up a lot of demos, doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, as you can see, his portal looked a lot better than mine. Um, so hopefully, we'll see you during the week at a lot of the other sessions. And with that, I'd like to uh, say thanks a lot. And if you have questions, we're going to stay around, and you can ask some questions as well. So again, thank you.